Okay, next we have Rose Gordy. Sit back and enjoy. My first published poem was about a student that I ran into in a shopping center one day when I was cashing my check. Now that everything's automatic, but it wasn't then. This is called To Larry Six Years Later. Walking down a shopping center sidewalk, out of the morning blue, she hears her name called in tones deeply masculine. She turns and sees the voice standing in front of her, a boy now grown to man, a handsome man smiling at her. Larry, she exclaims, forgetting his last name, but surprised and pleased he has seen and remembered her and called her by name. Both adults now, no longer English teacher and high school junior, no longer one who cajoles and one who rejects, no longer one who tries to motivate and one who refuses encouragement. Now just a man, and a, a woman and a man who used to work together. <laughs> he tells her his current life story, the part-time deck building business he owns, the pre-law night school class he attends, the fire company volunteer work he continues. She smiles impressed as she listens, immensely pleased that at least one former troublesome student has gone good. <laughs> then she hears him ask in a more serious, almost self-conscious voice, do you remember how much I used to hate English? <laughs> she laughs, remembering him at 17 all too well. The smart mouth kid who refused to do any homework, whose only interest was being a fire department volunteer. The lanky, flannel-shirted seat warmer who never even brought his books to class. The turned-off student who put his head down on his desk at every opportunity and hated writing most of all. Her memory flashes recedes as he continues. But you know what? I'd like to go back and do it all over and get what I missed. She shakes her head in understanding. Maturity comes late to some, but at least or last, it does come. Weeks later, as she drives home west on a major road, she passes the local rescue squad ambulance, traveling east with him at the wheel. And for the first time in her years, she wants to be an ambulance chaser, <laughs> if only to say, hi, Larry and celebrate the man he has become. And the follow-up on that, in recent years, I have heard that he is studying to be a minister. Oh. <laughs> it's called Life, Love, Joy, Peace. What is life but the living of it? A way of awakening, a dawn, we wander far from ourselves, only to find it there in us all along. What is love but the accepting of it, a way of cherishing a caress? We search for it far and wide, only to realize finally we must give it to ourselves before we can share it. What is joy but the glorying in it, a way of flying a bird. We search for it, but it so often eludes us. It's just around the corner, on our back step all the while. What is peace but the relishing of it, a way of thankfulness, a warmth? We wander looking the world for it, only to find it hidden deep within us all the while. What is heaven? but the loving of it, a wave of a happiness, an orgasm. We expect it in the other world, only to find it fleetingly within our hearts and souls right here. This is how
how intuition announces itself literally and figuratively in body and spirit. And I, I title it an autobiography in miniature. It's in six little sections and it runs from 1956 through 1996, which isn't my whole life, but kind of. Having a sense, an inkling, or flash of insight that something's about to happen. Getting an abrupt, out of the blue brainstorm to do something, to go out on a limb. Feeling a pain or jolt in the pit of my stomach for no apparent reason. Breaking out in goosebumps with a sudden shiver, heightening the senses. Just knowing to do or not to do something at a certain time. Hearing an inner voice saying to do or not to do, to go or not to go. One, ahead of time but without a decision made, I knew, in quotes, that the Christmas of 56 was to be my last one at home. I lived that long ago holiday season with that awareness telling no soul of my plans to become a nun after high school graduation. Living as though with multiple personalities, my 17-year-old fun-loving high school senior self and my idealistic, ready to sacrifice my all religious self. Actually, I did enter the convent on September 7th of the next year. Two, I knew weeks before an August 69 communication workshop in St. Louis that it was going to be very significant, so much so that I wrote a series of postcards to my special friends at the time asking them to pray for me. Actually, this workshop led to my key experience of birth at 30 the next month and subsequently to my decision to leave the convent that fall. Three, I knew in January of 70 when I went to inform the mother general that I decided to leave the convent that she would say if you're that sure leave it semester break at the end of the month. So I asked a priest friend ahead of time if she could make me leave then. He assured me I would call or could call all my own shots. Actually, she did tell me exactly that, and I said I would leave at the end of the school year, and so I left June 7th at the end of the semester, and had a job, by the way, when I left in Montgomery County. Four, I knew the summer of 74 was to be my last one as a single woman. So on the spur of the last moment at the beginning of summer vacation from teaching, I booked a flight to Martinique for a week's stint at Club Men. <laughs> Later that year, Ed and I became quite serious about each other. Actually, we were engaged at Christmas and married on the first day of spring the next year. By the way, uh, he's here in the room. Uh, he died in September of 09. Uh, number five, I knew I was carrying twins when my waist grew five inches during a week's holiday in Key West in February of 78. When I felt different from my other pregnancy seven years before with my first son, when I continued to expand like a happy birthday balloon, when I stretched out on the sonogram table at five months pregnant. Actually, in August 78, the day before my 39th birthday, I delivered twin sons by natural childbirth, Brendan at 11 p.m. and Patrick 50 minutes later. Ed and I celebrated their births and my birthday over orange juice in the recovery room. <laughs> Six, I knew in November of 96, while sitting in my friend Natalie's kitchen, that I had to leave the full-time classroom. I felt that same gut sensation as I did when I knew I had to leave the convent. I lived into the full realization through many concerns about money. Actually, I left teaching in June 97 
with no regrets, never looking back after 35 years straight, now with a coast all clear to the future. Oh, intuition, you remain my special inner guide to decisions and changes and new life. Now, several of these poems have been published, and this next one significantly was published in the newsletter of the community that I was in. It's called Leaving Home and Letting Go, and it has an epigram, some quotes from my favorite current poet Mary Oliver from a poem called In Blackwater Woods. And this, this is the part of the poem. To live in this world, you must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones knowing your whole life depends on it. And when the time comes to let it go, to let it go. My oldest son left for college today at the university in the next town, just 20 minutes from our house. Still, I couldn't hold back tears as I hugged him goodbye in his dorm. He'll be 18 in two months. And I remembered my leaving home three weeks after I turned 18 to enter a convent an hour away from my home in a small town, though really another world away. Imagining seeing my new self as my mother did as I came down the wide marble steps in the front hall of the mother house, shrouded in black from head to toe, her oldest daughter, another person in a strange world with strangers. And I could only guess how difficult it must have been for my mother to say goodbye to me, believing she would never see me again, at least not as a regular person, though she did a dozen years later when I left and married and had three sons in two years. Yet her grandmother had faced the worst of all these leavings, these letting goes, when her 17-year-old daughter at the turn of the century left her home on a farm in Hungary outside Budapest for a new life many worlds away in Braddock, Pennsylvania. Never going home again, those years later, her husband, also a native Hungarian, <laughs> had the money from two businesses he owned, a swimming pool and a coal mine, before the Depression took everything, including their way ever to go home again, ever to see their family and friends and their home country once more. Who's to say which mother actually had it harder? For each and all, goodbye was goodbye. The flesh of her flesh and bone of her bone would never be home again in the same way, no matter what or how or when, no matter if her son or daughter ever walked into the house again, never came to dinner on a holiday, or ever stayed the night again. No, it would never be the same. Still and all, I can't help believing it had to be the hardest for my great-grandmother to say goodbye to my grandmother-to-be. There was a finality in that leave-taking which went beyond time and space. As I've said to my high school students, it would be like leaving their families for Mars and never coming home again. One day before she died, Grandma told her youngest daughter that the day she left her family, she knew she would never go home again. Did her mother know as well? For someone who was going to live, live her life without men, I lucked out with four. <laughs> Very fortunate. Uh, this next poem connects with the watercoloring that I began a number of years ago, I, about 15 years ago, I started to rent a trailer from some monks on Big Sur where I would write and where I started to watercolor. In fact, the first watercolors I did were these bookmarks that a few people here know I made out of flattened out toilet rolls and watercolored <laughs> on both sides. 
but this one is my my major favorite one. It's uh, Sunset at Big Sur, and if you want to look at it later, I'll be here. So this poem connects with this. How do you paint? How do you paint <laughs> happiness that swirls you around in its arms? How do you paint what looks like sparkling stars swimming on top of the ocean? How do you paint love, the abiding kind? How do you paint trees nonchalantly blowing in the breeze? How do you paint the joys of friendship? Are all the colors of the rainbow enough? How do you paint the horizon when it's meshed with the water in the sky? How do you paint the loves of your life, even with the best fine brush you can buy? I ponder these questions here in a trailer I rent each year, overlooking the vast Pacific, knowing there are few answers, but always many questions to challenge my mind and soul. So with a sigh, I wonder more. When I leave this place this time, will I still be able to relish all of this lovely beauty during winters of snow and ice at home on the East Coast? And when it's dark in my soul, and it seems there's no respite, will I relive these two wondrous weeks in the San Lucia Mountains of Big Sur, where it's been like spring in December? I smile as the sun of high noon warms the tops of my bare feet as I write, knowing that answers will sometimes remain apart from all the many questions harassing my heart. This next poem is quite different from any of the other ones, but it, it's a major one and has been published at Deep Creek Lake where I live in a magazine there. Big Sur Fantasy. Drinking up the ocean, I clambered up the cliffs, took flight on condor wings, became the god of the sunrise and the goddess of the sunset. Reveling and awesome, I sang the sky, ate the tides, smelled the horizon, and tasted the fog. But it was not enough. Flying higher on possibility, I carved out new precipices tinted the sand turquoise, <coughs> straightened the windy roads, and colored the sky indigo. Then I flew over the horizon, satiated with my stunning artistry. <laughs> this, this is another one that relates to everything here, to writing, to painting, to creativity to the artists that we all are. And it's called, What If Monet Had Been a Writer? <laughs> what if Monet had been a writer, Shakespeare a sculpturer, Debussy an impressionistic painter, O'Neill an opera singer, Hopkins a graphic artist, Grandma Moses a biographer, O'Keefe a dancer, Rilke, a composer, Picasso, a poet, Chopin, a choreographer, Porter, a playwright. Is art all one? Is the genius the pride of the creation? Or is the pride of the creation the genius? Is the vision varied and specialized so much because we can't be all things to all men and women, or even to ourselves in the one lifetime we have. Do artists reincarnate themselves as different types of artists in numerous other lifetimes? What do we really know about expression, the creative imagination, the right brain of our psyches? What are the mysteries of our minds waiting to be discovered by our children and their children? Where do stillborn inspirations go? Do they hover in the air waiting to find new fertile imaginations? And what about all those unsung, unknown artists of every type and genre? What happens to their works when there's no one to appreciate them? 
Is it like the old question, what is the sound of a tree falling if there's no one to hear it in the forest? How plant and savor and embrace new art for this 21st century? Who will listen and love and learn? Next to last poem is about a key poem on a trip to Ireland with my oldest son. It's called Mizzenhead. Waves crashing, winds howling at this southernmost point of Ireland in the Atlantic. Wondering if, as the story goes, three Irish brothers, my husband's, husband's ancestors, really stood near here or perhaps at Queenstown before leaving home around 1600 for the streets of gold in the semi-mythical America. <coughs> now, hundreds of years later, my three sons are their descendants, the oldest one standing with me at the lighthouse in the raging 70 mile per hour gales, holding on to each other, holding up against the winds. My last poem is the poem for the title of the book, The Stairs to the Attic. And if you come up here later, you'll see a picture of what I looked like in my 20s with the long habit and all the starch and everything. It's called The Stairs to the Attic. For years after she left the convent and married a computer analyst, baptized a Southern Baptist as a teenager, she would invite her ex-nun friends to her house for dinner. Invariably, they would laugh about the crazy things they used to have to get permission to do when they first entered the community. Wash their hair, press their habits, and go to the attic. And invariably, her husband or one of the other husbands would ask, why would you want to go to the attic? Then the beginning of the story would come out. It was Pittsburgh and very cold in the winter. There wasn't room for their big woolen shawls and their boots in the small closets in the big dorms, so they had to go up to the attic to retrieve those items from their huge steamer trunks. The main problem was that every time they got on the elevator to go to the attic, they had to have a companion. It seemed that a certain old nun was standing there with her huge protruding stomach and very deep voice. She always stared straight ahead and scared them. After all, to them as teenagers at the time, sisters seemed like a dirty old man disguised in nun's clothes. <laughs> they held their breath the whole time it took to go up and down. At this point, a question always interrupted their story's flow. In the beginning, it always came from her left-brained husband. Why didn't you just use the stairs? As one woman, they always responded, there were no stairs. And he would, on cue, incredulously reply, come on now, it was a hundred-some-year-old building. It had to have stairs to the attic. No, they would repeat, there were no stairs. The same exchange continued for years. Then one day an announcement came about the first reunion of all the ex-nuns of their community to be held at the mother house and she decided to go. Though initially she thought it might be a ploy for money, it wasn't. In fact, they were even told to consider the order their second home that would always be there for them. Years later, the nuns did provide a short-term safe haven for one of her crowd after she left her threatening husband. When the nun MC announced that they could revisit the novitiate floor of the mother house, where there are no nuns now, it, she knew it was her chance to prove her husband wrong, or in the outside, chance, right. The women in the group dubbed innies or outies, not aware of her agenda, thought she was acting strangely when she checked out every nook and cranny of the halls where they had lived their first six years. 
Walking down the last hall of the mistress of Postulant's office, she saw the small four-bed dorm where she was assigned the Saturday she entered, three weeks after she turned 18. She remembered getting into her white-sheeted single bed in her long white cotton nightgown as the clock of the church down the street chimed nine, and she said to herself, what should have been her first indication she did not belong there. Oh my God, it's nine o'clock Saturday night and look where I am. <laughs> Across the hall from this storm was their old vile classroom. Next to it was a door with a knob which turned as she touched it. Lo and behold, there were the stairs to the attic. Her husband of course, had been right. <laughs> As a symbolic action, she walked up the stairs, which certainly had always been there, to, kind, to give a kind of hard copy life to their reality. And the women standing with her thought she had lost it. When she pondered the significance later of it all, she realized that the whole experience had been a metaphor for all they, as intelligent young women, had willingly given up. After all, they had never once questioned why they had to use the elevator to go to the attic or why there were no stairs. They had never even wondered what was behind that door she had found so many years later, which actually led to the attic. They had given up their questions, their thinking minds to God, and the sad fact of the matter was they had sacrificed too much. They had given up and away their basic selves. They had denied themselves and accepted the belief they had to do it to save their souls, to be good sisters. And like all the women before them, in or out of the convent, they let themselves become subservient, non-thinking pawns in the hands of those in power whether they be defeminized nuns in habits or macho men in business suits. Mm -hmm. She laughed every time she told this story to a new person, but under that laughter hid a little piece of regret about those early years so long ago when she didn't use her head as her father had always advised, losing a part of herself in the process which took her decades to retrieve. And there are two parts to add to this. The reunion after the one in this story, I found out that down a far hall, blocked by a life-size statue, was another set of stairs to the attic. <laughs> and when I was there at the mother house a couple of summers ago, waiting for some friends, a couple of nuns and a couple of ex-nuns that were going out to dinner or lunch with me, the, the ladies' room by the chapel was being fixed, so I went wandering through. No one knew I wasn't a nun anymore. I looked the same as they do because they all were most of them wear regular clothes now. And I ended up on that floor, down that same hall. And as I speak, on the door to the attic is a sign this big, the stairs to the attic. <laughs> <laughs>